Would you turn with me to Genesis chapter 42? Genesis 42, it's page 36 if you're using the Pew Bible. And we're going to be beginning in Genesis 42, verse 29. And we're going to be going all the way through chapter 43, verse 15. So Genesis 42, 29 through Genesis 43, 15. Beginning now in verse 29. When they came to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke roughly to us and took us to be spies of the land. But we said to him, We are honest men. We have never been spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the younger is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I shall know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me, and take grain for the famine of your households, and go your way. Bring your youngest brother to me, then I shall know that you are not spies, but honest men, and I will deliver your brother to you, and you shall trade in the land. As they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you would take Benjamin? All this has come against me. Then Reuben said to his father, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. Now the famine was severe in the land, and when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little food. But Judah said to him, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel said, Why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? They replied, The man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, Is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was in answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said to Israel, his father, Send the boy with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would, not, we would now have returned twice. Then their father said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man, a little balm and a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take double the money with you. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise. Go again to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man. And may he send back your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So the men took this present and they took double the money with them. And Benjamin, they arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. Would you join me in prayer? Father, as we come before you, we marvel that we even get to come before you. We marvel that you would speak to us. What can we offer to a God like you? You have no needs. 
You've made us. There's nothing we could do to impress you. Father, our, our sinfulness, our, uh, the remaining sin that's in us, even those of us whom you've uh, given these new hearts to, Father, it stains everything we do. And yet, Father, because you are so deserving, so worthy, so wonderful, because you're our God, Lord Jesus, because you're our Savior, Holy Spirit, because you're our companion and comforter, we want to bring you our worship. We want our preaching and our hearing and receiving and response to the Word to be a worshipful offering to you. We know we can't, what we offer can't match up to what you are deserving of, but we do desire to give it nonetheless. And we thank you that it's sanctified in Christ, that you're pleased to receive it. So as you minister to us, help us, Father, to offer up our worship to you. And may it all be for your glory. As we go through this text, Father, as we hear your word proclaimed, oh, let us hearts, our hearts be thrilled with your glory. Give us hearts to love you more and more, Father. We ask it now, trusting that you will do such things because you love your people. Thank you for your love for us. We love you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we started this little mini-series about two weeks ago. Uh, we were looking through chapters 42 through 45, and we see this extended interaction between Joseph and his brothers. Uh, and I, I suggested to you that really we, we are, are, uh, the, the structure, underlying structure here is that we see Joseph uh, present a test, then the brothers pass the test. Then he presents another test. And they pass that test as well, and then we get to see the blessing that comes after the test is passed. And we are here on our second, uh, second uh, s sermon in this little series. And so we're seeing last week or two weeks ago, we saw they were confronted with a test. And it was God really testing them through Joseph. We remember the brothers, they came down to Egypt. They were looking for food, and they encountered Joseph. And they didn't recognize him, but he knew who they were. And they bowed before him. And they thought, we're just bowing before this Egyptian official. But Joseph, he remembered his dream from over 20 years ago. Joseph knew that God was at work, but the ten brothers were in the dark. And Joseph clearly wanted to know more of the welfare of his father and his younger brother, Benjamin. But could he trust what his brothers would say if he revealed himself? So he devised a test to see if he could trust his brothers. Were they the same murderous men as they were once before? Or have they changed over the years? So here's the test. He accused them of being spies, and he took Simeon into custody. And he said, if you want to live, you've got to bring back that youngest brother who's not with you. Bring Benjamin. On top of this, unbeknownst to them, he returned their money that they had brought to buy grain. He put it back in their sacks. And all that together sets up the test. What will they do now? Will they take the money and run and sell out Simeon like they did with Joseph long ago? Or will they come back with Benjamin to rescue Simeon, even though it means putting themselves at great personal risk? We also saw that the brothers were clearly shaken by all of this. God had reawakened their consciences. Throughout all of this, they remembered how they betrayed Joseph long ago, and they believed that after all these years, God was finally punishing them for their crime, and they, they wondered aloud, what is this that God has done to us? And so as we come now in verse 29, we're, we're going to see more of how they respond to this test, and much of this is reflective of how we respond when we are put in times of testing, but it's also instructive. It's going to give us insight into how we should and shouldn't respond to God's tests in our lives. Verse 29 tells us that they returned to Canaan, to their father, and it says they told him all that had happened to them. Now, if we're not reading carefully, we might take that and say, yeah, they gave their father the full story. 
But when you read the text carefully, you see, no, they, they actually didn't give him the full story. They summarized all that happened to them, and what they said was generally true, but they left some key details out. They left out the most terrifying parts. It seems like what they say to their father is carefully crafted. They say nothing about being taken into custody for three days. They clean up what happened to Simeon. Notice their language in verse 33. They almost make it sound like Simeon was invited to stay for a little while. Uh, leave one of your brothers with me. That's not what happened. Verse 24, we learned earlier, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. It wasn't just, oh, just leave your brother with me. They leave out the full consequences as well. When they get to the end of verse 34, they make it sound like to their father, if we don't go back we'll, we'll, with our brother, we'll, we'll never be able to trade in the land. But that's not what Joseph warned them of. Back in verse 20, he warned them, bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die. This man had threatened their lives, but they didn't want to mention that to dad. Nor did they say anything about the money being in their sacks, which they had rediscovered before returning to him. Why did they soften their story in these ways? I think the most evident reason is uh, they probably didn't want Jacob to be afraid of sending Benjamin with them, mentioning things like prison and death threats and uh, uh, being viewed as thieves. That's not going to help their cause. But I also suspect there's more going on here. Notice, and we saw this two weeks ago in the previous passage, they keep repeating that claim of being honest men. That phrase appears three times in their little six-verse summary to their father. And yet, they still haven't been honest men. They haven't been honest, even here, they haven't been fully honest about what happened in Egypt. Nor have they come clean about Joseph. Their hearts have been pricked. But they dare not mention to their father what really happened, even though they suspect God is punishing them for it. So while they're clearly here trying to keep back the full truth from Jacob, I suspect that they might still be trying to keep the full truth back from themselves. It appears there's still some willful self-deception going on, or we might use the word we sometimes use today, they're, they're, they're in denial. They're not fully facing what the reality of the situation is. If they don't speak about the full severity of what has happened, well, then they don't have to think about how bad things really are. They can deny that this is a matter of life and death. They can deny that it's a matter of their own guilt before God. If we can just get Benjamin back down to Egypt and get Simeon back, they may have thought, well, maybe they'll never have to think about what they did to Joseph again. The first response here that we are seeing is the response of denial. The response of denial. How many of us during a time of trial and testing when God's hand is heavy upon us have responded with denial? Maybe if I don't think about the trial, it will just go away. How many times has that worked? It doesn't. Maybe we suspect that from the way God is working that He's targeting a particular sin in our lives. He's already pricked our consciences as he did for these brothers and we know there's a problem but for some reason we aren't yet ready to repent i don't want to apologize to that person i offended it would be humiliating i don't want to take the hard steps that would be required for reconciliation i don't want to give up my sin if it will disrupt my comfort i don't want to give up my sin if it will cost me something so we take the response of denial. We downplay our circumstances. We hide from ourselves how serious things actually are. But here's a good thing. It can feel terrible in the moment, but it's wonderful in truth. When God is working in our lives and he's using a test to both shape us and to reveal our character, he mercifully won't let us ignore those sins that would destroy us. We might try to ignore them. He won't let us We've, we've seen this many times in Genesis. We've seen God use many tests. And there's often been this children's nursery rhyme that has come to mind for me. I don't think I've shared this with you before. Uh, I think children, you, you might know what it is. Adults, maybe some of you will. It, it, it's called We're Going on a Bear Hunt or some variation of that. I see some of you shaking your head. You've heard this before. 
I will try to spare you the sing-song voice. It goes something like this. We're going on a bear hunt. We're going on a bear hunt. We are not scared. We are not scared. And then through the course of the little poem, the little song, uh, there's various obstacles that they encounter. And it goes a little something like this. Oh, look, there's some tall, wavy grass. Well, what are they going to do? Can't go over it. We can't go under it. We just have to go through it. That's how it is with a test from God. We can't avoid them through denial. We can't go over them. We can't go under them. We have to go through them. Remember his work at the Red Sea. On one side, the Egyptian army. Certain death. On the other side, the sea. Well, that's certain death as well. And yet the psalmist says in Psalm 77, 19, your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters. What appeared to be certain death was the very way that God intended them to go. And so we must face that which God is calling us to face. Denial only delays the inevitable. Denial allows the rot longer to fester. Denial ignores the cancer and allows it to spread through the body. When God has laid a heavy test upon us, let us face the reality of it as we seek Him to deliver us through it. Well, let's turn our attention now to the paragraph beginning in verse 35. We see the brothers have stopped talking, and now they empty their sacks in Jacob's presence. It says, as they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack, And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. We have to ask, what's going on here? Back in verses 27 and 28, we already saw that at least one brother, if not all of them, the text pointed out only one, uh, discovered his money was returned and he informed the rest. And they were afraid back then. They trembled. Are the rest just discovering this now that the money was returned? Did they not look back then? We don't know. It could be that they didn't look and they thought it was only one and said, wow, it's all of us. But even if that's the case, I, that's not all that the text is communicating. The emphasis is on Jacob's presence and Jacob's reaction. Notice in verse 35, when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. I, I believe that it's Jacob's reaction in part that incites fear because see what happens verse 35 he sees all this money what does he immediately do in verse 36 he accuses them and Jacob their father said to them you have bereaved me of my children Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more and now you would take Benjamin all this has come against me look how cold his language is in verse 38 he distances himself from the brothers by referring to Benjamin as his son His son, not their brother. He says that Benjamin is his only son left. Whew. They knew that Jacob played favorites, but he's speaking like they are nothing to him. This is a father speaking in anger. But consider what this man has just seen from his perspective. For the second time in about 20 years, these brothers have returned without one of their brothers. The first time, they let Joseph's bloody coat do the talking. This time, they've told a story about being accused of being spies. And yet, look, even though they're accused of being spies, they have all this food. And they have all this money. The story doesn't line up. Jacob's accusations suggest that he thought the worst. He says, you've bereaved me of my children. You did something to Simeon. I know it. Although he doesn't say it directly, he may have suspected that they sold Simeon as a slave. How else could they get all this food without having to spend any of their money? There's no way, seeing this, there's no way that Jacob is going to allow them to take Benjamin. I'm not going to let you do this to another one of my sons. Well, Reuben, in response, blurts out his poorly thought through response. Verse 37, then Reuben said to his father, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. Reuben's suggestion here is ridiculous on multiple fronts. First of all, 
he had no authority to offer the lives of his innocent children. That's not what Israelites do. That was something that Canaanites did, offering up their innocent children to death. And what grandfather would want this? What grandfather, after losing a son, says, oh, you know what will make me feel better? Why don't I kill a couple of grandsons? It's, it's, it's preposterous. It fixes nothing. I want you to notice two things about his proposed solution. First of all, it costs Reuben nothing personally. It cost him nothing personally. He might say, well, well, it could cost him his sons. But what father would offer his sons like this? What father would offer his sons in his own place? He's placed the burden on his sons rather than himself. Second, it's counter-covenantal. It's counter-covenantal. God had promised to give Jacob many descendants, but Reuben's proposal... Should Benjamin die, could lead to more descendants being killed. That's not in the spirit of the covenant. And so Reuben's proposed solution, should he fail to protect Benjamin, it seems to be rooted in this fleshly presumption that Jacob will want vengeance and retribution. He wasn't thinking spiritually, he was thinking carnally. And the scriptures clearly teach us that fleshly thinking only and always leads to death. So we might call Reuben's response here the response of the flesh, the response of the flesh, or alternatively, the response of death, the response of death. This is not the way that God wants us to respond to the tests that He brings into our lives. You cannot solve a spiritual problem with a fleshly solution. But how many times have we tried? Like Reuben, who thought the suggestion of death on top of death would work. Sometimes we've done this with lies. Have you ever been there where you try to lie your way out of a problem that you lied your way into? If I just tell one more, I especially remember childhood doing this. If I just keep telling lies, maybe I can get out of this pit. But instead of getting out of the pit, each lie is like another shovel full of dirt digging the pit deeper. Children, I, as I was thinking about this, there was something that came to mind. I found these, these very interesting videos on, on YouTube of somebody on a high snowy mountain takes a, a little snowball, just something like this, and they roll it down the mountain. And it does just what it does in the cartoons that I grew up watching. The little snowball gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it becomes a snow boulder. And that's what happens when we keep trying to tell a lie to get our way out of a problem. We keep telling lies, thinking it'll solve a problem, but that little lie just gets bigger and bigger until it becomes an avalanche that crushes us. When God's test is meant to reveal and deal with some particular sin in our lives, we cannot sin our way out of the test. Sin on top of sin only begets death. The gambler who tries to gamble his way out of debt only further destroys his finances. The people pleaser who runs into conflicts and says, well, I'll just, I'll please more people. I'll try to make more people happy. Uh, Destroys himself. You go crazy from that. The man who tries to cure his pornography problem by acting out his perverse desires upon his wife destroys his marriage. It's all death on top of death. That was Reuben's proposed solution, but it's not how we are to pass God's tests. We come now to chapter 43, and some time has passed. Yet the famine remains, but the food is gone. Jacob is forced to face the reality that someone's going to have to go down to Egypt. Someone's going to have to get food. But he still doesn't want to send his dear son Benjamin. Now we see that Judah gives an excellent and persuasive solution. And before we look at his response, notice... This is the second time that we've seen in Genesis where Judah is more influential than Reuben. Do you remember the first time? The first time happened back when they were dealing with Joseph, uh, when they betrayed him. Reuben, the brothers were just going to kill Joseph right there, and Reuben's thought was, hey, let's just throw him in a pit, like an open grave. Let's let's just throw him in a pit. We won't do it ourselves. We'll let him die there. And Reuben, the text told us, was secretly thinking, I'll come back and rescue him. And we don't know if that's because 
Reuben felt for him or was trying to get back in his dad's good graces. But while Reuben was away, at some point, Judah was the one who influenced his brothers further and said, you know what, let's, let's not just leave him there to die. Let's, let's sell him off. Let's make some money off of this. So Judah had once been more influential than Reuben in matters of sin. Here he's more influential in a noble way. Remember through uh, his dealings with Tamar that we read about earlier. Judah is already a changed man. We've seen that. God has already shown Judah his own unrighteousness. He's brought him to true repentance in his life. And now Judah is going to be the one to lead his brothers forward in a righteous response. And his influence over his brothers, both previously and here, is an early hint that kingship would come from the line of Judah. His righteousness here is a hint that the Messiah, the Savior, will come from his line as well. But let's look at his specific response, verses 8 and 9. And Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy with me, and we will arise and go that we may live and not die both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. Notice why this is an excellent response. First, it's an excellent response because it is in line with God's covenant. It's just the opposite of Reuben's proposal in this way. Reuben's suggestion would bring more death. Judah's focused on life, that we may live and not die. That in, this, uh, in the previous chapter, that phrase was repeated multiple times. Judah comes back to it, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. No grandchildren have to die this way. This is for life. Second, It's an excellent response because Judah assumes all of the cost and risk personally. I will be a pledge of his safety. Let me bear the blame forever. Now again, we don't know how many weeks have passed since this, the end of chapter 42, the beginning of chapter 43. But it wasn't all that long ago that Jacob was accusing all of his older sons. You've cost me Joseph, now you've cost me Simeon. But here's what Judah says. If we don't bring Benjamin back, I alone will bear the blame. Don't blame all the brothers. It will be on me. I will absorb the shame and the guilt and the ignominy, and my brothers will be cleared. Can you see the likeness of Christ in that? I hope you can. You should be able to see that Jesus Christ, although he was sinless and guiltless, in order to establish the new covenant, He took all the sin and the guilt of his brothers upon himself. Isaiah 53 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He said, I'll bear it. I'll take it. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He bore the sin of many. The Apostle Paul describes it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Judah's response is the response of Christ-likeness. The response of Christ-likeness, or alternatively, the response of life. The response of life. When we are in Christ, every test that God brings into our lives is aimed at producing Christ-likeness in us. That test is applying pressure uh, that serves, like, uh, serves to, to press us down into a mold to conform us to the image of God's Son. As the flesh produces death, Christ-like work of the Spirit in us produces life. You say, well, we have the Spirit. We've been made new. He's using these tests to shape us. Why then don't we immediately respond in a Christ-like way to every test that comes along? Well, for one, God hasn't completed His sanctifying work in us. That's yet to be perfected. But also because it's hard. Because we're not yet sanctified, uh, responding in a Christ-like way is hard because it involves personal sacrifice. It involves cost. It's our Lord who said, as we read earlier, 
if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In times of testing, the remaining sin that is in us, that is the flesh, it screams out for self-gratification. Me, me, me. But the Spirit is leading us in the way of self-denial. The only way that leads to experiencing that fullness of life that comes from Christ so that He might be glorified in us. And so in the moment, in that moment of testing, the Christ-like response involves sacrifice. It, it, It feels like death. It feels like taking up a cross, an instrument of death. That's not a natural response. That's not how any of us would respond to our tests or our trials if it were not for Christ having gone before us, having redeemed us, having sent His Spirit to dwell within us. Brothers and sisters, if you are presently in a time of testing or you're soon to face a test from God, you already know the answer to this test. This is a wonderful thing. In a general sense, even though you don't maybe know precisely what it is, you may not be at that point in the testing, you know in a general sense what the answer is. The answer, the response you should give, it's Christ-likeness. It's sacrifice. It's self-denial. It might look like laying down that pride that you've been carrying as you refuse to forgive the person who keeps wronging you. You have anybody like that in your life who keeps sinning against you and you keep forgiving them? Uh, The flesh cries out, but I've already forgiven her seven times. But what does the Spirit say? Not seven times but 70 times 7. Keep forgiving at the cost of selfish pride. Maybe the Lord, maybe the test has taken this shape in your life. He's placed some great need in front of you. It's right there. And it's a test because responding to that need would require some great sacrifice of time or something like money. And maybe you've wrestled with this where you even feel it almost like tightness in your chest where you're saying, I see the need, and there's part of me that wants to respond. But if I respond, it's going to hurt. It's going to take something from me. If you give your time, that means there's something else that you don't get to do. For some of you, God may be testing you in this way right now, and it feels unrelenting. What he is calling from you, the time it requires, is wearying and draining, and the flesh will say to you, you've already done enough. Haven't you already done enough? You barely have enough time for yourself as it is. But what does our Lord say? Take up your cross and follow me. If the sacrifice is a matter of money, well, if you give money, that means you have to go without something else. And what does the flesh say? You worked so hard for it. You deserve it. Well, if you're going to give it, at least just, just don't give too much. But you remember how our Lord commended the poor widow who out of her poverty gave all that she had to live on? Maybe you're thinking as I'm preaching these things, preacher, you're making me feel guilty. I don't like that. Stop it, preacher. Don't you know I'm already too hard on myself as it is? I don't need to hear this sort of message. I beat myself up enough as it is. Don't add guilt on top of that. If that's how you're feeling, if that's the response you're experiencing internally, I do want to ask you to simply reckon with that feeling, that feeling of, oh, I need to block this out because I already beat myself up too much. Is that the flesh or the spirit speaking? Would you reckon with that? Reckon over that before the Lord. Also consider, I've put no restraints upon you this morning. I don't know what particular test God has before any of you, so I'm not trying, this isn't, I'm not trying to manipulate you with preaching this morning. I'm not preaching to try to fill the offering baskets. That's not the goal of this preaching. How you give, to what needs you give towards, how, how, you know, time, money, energy, whatever, what you're giving to what you're giving it to, that's between you and the Lord. I'm preaching what many souls here, mine included, need to hear, that sacrifice isn't comfortable. 
True sacrifice means giving till it hurts. It doesn't mean sacrifice is not giving from an overflow. When there's overflow, where's the sacrifice? There's no need for sacrifice. Sacrifice is when we give from a lack. As the Spirit moves us, there's that external lack, a lack of money, a lack of time, and yet the Spirit can move in us as we read in the Scriptures of how He worked amongst the Macedonian churches where He can move in us to where there's, a, there's an external lack, but internally He builds up an overflow of generosity. And what we must hear, and this is so important, please don't miss this, Christ Himself must be the foundation of all self-sacrifice in Christ-likeness. Christ himself must be the foundation of all self-sacrifice in Christ-likeness. If you try to be like Christ without having Christ at the center, without seeing him as the foundation, it will be wearisome, it will be toil. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, this is the sort of thing we must have in view. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Brothers and sisters, in our time of testing, we can embrace painful self-denial because Christ has already made us rich. He's already made us rich. This is true, so true. We have nothing to lose. We have nothing to lose. Our spiritual riches are unassailable. The thief can't steal them. Moths can't come and eat them all up. Rust can't destroy them. And so I say to you, don't don't fear. If if the test that God has you in, it's calling for that Christ-like self-sacrifice, don't fear giving too much. The flesh wants you to fear giving too much. Don't fear it. As the old preacher said, you can't outgive God. Do you think God, I've had this twisted thought before, do you ever think this, that God might somehow punish you for being too generous? If I'm too self-sacrificial, well, maybe I won't have enough. Maybe I'll run out of something. No. It's God, if you are, because you want to, uh, because you love your Lord and you love those he's put before you, you give some great sacrifice for them, do you think God's going to punish you for that? Surely not. Psalm 37, 25, David says, and many of you have seen this as well, I have been young and now am old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. Think about what the Apostle Paul said to those generous, self-sacrificing Philippians. Philippians 4, 19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So when God places us in that test that leads us into Christ-like sacrifice, we lay down our sins, resting in Christ's righteousness. We expend our energy, resting in Christ's strength. We generously give our money, resting in Christ's riches. And this is how Judah led his brothers in passing that first test. He embraced a Christ-like self-denial. Well, finally and very quickly, let us come to verses 11 through 14. 11 through 14, we see now Jacob, he relents. He's going to let the brothers take Benjamin with them, and he says, you know, just to be wise, to be careful, take a gift with you for the Egyptian official. Take double the money uh, to avoid the charge of theft. And finally, Jacob, through all the fear and anxiety that he must have been experiencing, he sets his eyes on God, verse 14. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send back your other brother in Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. It's not the most optimistic prayer, is it? He kind of ends on that note of thinking, well, I may lose him, but it's an honest prayer of submission. He submitted to God Almighty. That's the final response to testing that we need to see, and it goes hand in hand with the previous one, the response of submission. The response of submission. I'll keep this very simple. Have you submitted to the Lord in your time of testing? Have you submitted to Him? 
and your test may be very heavy. Again, the, 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 what we are given here, the, the historical situation that God arranged for our benefit to be recorded in Scripture for us who would be here today was these brothers who are in a life and death situation. Your situation may be like that. It may feel like that. It may be hard for you to imagine the test ending well. You may not be able to uh, even optimistically think of some rosy outcome. And even if it's hard and that bad, nevertheless, have you handed it over to the Lord? He said, Lord, I trust you with this. I'm putting this into your hands, God Almighty. Maybe you need to say that this morning. If you've not, if if you've not, you certainly need to say that, Lord. I don't know when the hurting will stop. I don't know when life will stop being so hard. I don't know when you'll bring relief. But Lord, I trust you. Can you say that to him this morning? I don't know, but I trust you. I trust you with whatever outcome you bring. Can you say something like Jacob said, if I'm bereaved of my children, I'm bereaved. Lord, if you take things away from me, I trust you. And then can you commit by the strength that God gives, can you say to him, I'm going to keep taking up my cross and following Jesus, knowing that you, God Almighty, will lead me in the paths of everlasting life. If you've not submitted to God in that way yet, now is the time to do so. Now is a wonderful time to do so. I'd ask you, I'd encourage you to do so as we go to the Lord in prayer. Let us go to him now in a spirit of humble submission. Father, help us to see that that hand that feels so heavy upon us at times is the same hand that lifts us up through the trials. Help us to see that it is the hand of steadfast love and faithfulness, not the hand of cruelty, but the hand of mercy. And help us, Father, to submit all of who we are and all that we encounter to you. Lord, having considered this text, it has made me wonder, both of myself and of others in this congregation, are you asking things of us? Like we saw here with Judah, for the sake that the whole family would live and survive, he said, I'll take the blame on myself. You put it on me. Are you asking us, Father, some of us this morning? Well, surely you're asking all of us in some degree. But are there some particular works that you're doing, Father? We're standing in Christ's sacrifice and what he has already done in our behalf, resting in his riches that you're calling us to sacrifice in some way and that we're we're resisting, we're wrestling, or we're trying to uh, sin our way out of sin. Father, you're the one who sees the heart and knows the heart, and you know each one, and you know how to shepherd us perfectly through each and everything we encounter. We pray that you will do that work. Apply your word that you've so graciously spoken to us. Lord, as we submit those things that we've been holding back from you, we pray that we could sing this next song uh, with a clear and clean heart, that we could sing it as well with my soul. Not because everything outside of us is quiet, but because with you in your presence, our souls are quiet because we've learned to trust you. You've taught us to trust you, our trustworthy, wonderful God. In Christ's name, amen.